Hi everyone, Kayla here. I want to begin this podcast with a quick warning. Um, horror stories and novels tend to address subjects that are distressing, uncomfortable, and, well, scary, obviously, which is why we always mark our podcast episodes as explicit. Um, we, we hope that our listeners know going into this that we will be discussing subjects that aren't always going to be kid-friendly. However, some works of literature, such as the one we are reading today, or we're discussing today, include subjects that can genuinely be upsetting for those who have had traumatic experience or have mental illness, etc. For the future, we'll make sure that listeners uh, will receive warnings ahead of time if severely sensitive sub... sub <laughs> try saying that three times fast. Severely sensitive subjects are brought up in the novel or whatever story we're listening to by listing them in the podcast episode or writing them in the show notes and uh, as well as posting them on our Twitter at darkly lit pod. The novel we're about to discuss, uh, let the right one in does contain subjects of um, that. These types of sub sensitive subjects, which is pedophilia and extreme violence against children. Um, and with this book, since it is a long one, we'll be spending the next few months discussing this novel. So if um, any of these subjects that I just mentioned are triggering at all, please feel free to skip them. Um, as always, listener discretion is advised. Uh, thank you for your support and feedback, and I hope uh, you enjoyed the show. Welcome to Darkly Lit, where we wander through the cold night to better understand the complexities of characters' moralities. We are the Three Kings. I am Kayla King. Staring into my eyes right now is uh, my husband, David King. I stabbed a tree, and all my dreams came true. <laughs> I was going to say, his eyes full of stars. <laughs> yes. No, they're just blank, black, gray, just like... I like a murderer. <gasps> and then uh uh to the north of us is our good friend and our uh other king, Said. Or Reyes, that's why I'm also king. <laughs> Said Reyes. <laughs> uh I'm ready for this guys. We've got this I've got a nice large glass of banana and bean hot butter smoother and I'm ready to go. Nice. I'm so jealous of you right now. That sounds um, really good. Actually, uh, there's a point in the book where um, they mentioned eating, uh, having hot cocoa and cinnamon buns, and I was like, that sounds so amazing. There's some good, like, food descriptions here. Or watch, what was it? Watching nutcrackers and eating crepes? Yeah, it was like, like crepes with shrimp. Crepes filled with shrimp? I'm like, boo. I yeah, love it. Yeah. I love crepes. crepes. Savory crepes, sweet crepes, give me all them crepes. crepes I love good, them. good, man. I'm usually a sweet <laughs> crepe person, but me, yeah. Me too. Um, but I just like crepes in general. There's a new crepe place here in Portland. You guys need to come visit and we'll go because that's all they serve are like a variety of crepes. Oh, hell yeah. Oh, that sounds so good. I'm all for that. Uh, so we just read the part one. Let me make that clear. We don't, we just finished part one of Let the Right One In by John uh, Avide Linquist. I'm hoping I said that right. <laughs> that sounded right to me. Yeah, well awesome. done, actually. Thank you. Um... <clears throat> The interesting thing about this book is it's a Swedish book or originally wish written in Swedish. So, um, naturally, of, of course, we're reading the English translation. So, which is pretty good, I gotta say. I think that they they um, the translator still gets the the translation still get the point across. Mm -hmm. I mean, I feel sure. like it does for the most part. But, yeah. Um, I believe Say was uh, offered uh, himself as tribute. To <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I volunteered. Yes. Uh, to do summary of part one. So the book opens, actually, it opens uh, where we're learning about this delivery guy. Like, uh, like furniture delivery is my guess. Mm -hmm. uh, where he apparently learns that uh, this unsuspecting father and daughter that he just moved in, helped move, is uh, 
not what they appeared, and he finds that uh, they did something so grisly that he's not going to tell anybody that he ever met them. Um, and then from there, we go and we meet our protagonist, Oscar, who is a 12-year-old boy. Like many 12-year-old boys, is going to school and having the time of his life and joined childhood. No. Um, <laughs> The the scene, and I really want to talk about this opening scene. Well, not the opening scene, the scene that follows. Um, mm-hmm. Oscar, we learn right away, um, has an issue with bullies. And he's even to the point where speaking out of class is a risk. Um, he's tormented by his bully, Johnny and Thomas. And I think there's another one who's name I already forgot but he's got his bullies to deal with and then he's got his uh, somewhat overbearing mother who just really wants to wants him safe um, and I, we do get the impression that he cares for his mother but uh, he's got his secrets too like all young boys and children tend to do <laughs> um, so as we're as alongside as we're as we're learning about Oscar um, we're also introduced to Hawken, who we first meet on, I think, the train. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. He's on the train uh, headed uh, to a couple towns over from where he recently moved to, to a forest. And we're realizing he's on a little bit of a quest to being an errand for his beloved um, that is quite grisly and... Well, spoiler warning. I mean, hopefully you read the book, but he kills a kid. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, to harvest the kid's blood for his beloved, which we later meet through Oscar first. Yes, we do meet her through Oscar. Yeah. Um, Hawken and his beloved Eli have moved into the same building literally next door to Oscar and Oscar meets Eli on the playground where he lends her his Rubik's Cube and Eli seems to Oscar like just a normal for the most part normal girl Um, but she does seem strange she kind of has a bad smell she's outside in just a thin sweater um, but he's curious about her. Um, but we, from Hawkins' side of the story, we discover that she is definitely not what she seems and is the one coaxing Hawkins to commit murder um, for her so that she can drink blood. But what I find the most fascinating thing is Oscar seems to have uh, quite the interesting... Um, fascination with some morbid subjects, mm-hmm. like like murder, and also has uh, some violent fantasies of uh, stabbing his bullies to death when uh, he heads out to uh, stab at this rotting trunk or log. Uh, it happens to line up with uh, Hawkins' murder of the boy, and for a little while, Oscar's like, oh shit, did I telepathically murder this kid? That'd be so cool. <laughs> um, and the part one ends with uh, Ile ha- is uh, forced to go out and hunt for herself because Hawken doesn't want to kill for her anymore. And the part one ends with Hawken having to dispose of uh, Ile's kill. Hmm. Well said. Oh, and there's some there's some other shit we learned about Hawkin, but I will get to that. Oh, we're gonna. Ha- I mean, we're gonna have to. Um, yeah. Um, let's let's. Start I, I do want to say this. This marks an uh, a new way we're doing some of Darkly Lit, and that we are actually encouraging people to once we're done with this part, hey, maybe go read the book and come join us for this like discussion. We're gonna be in this book for a few episodes, mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. Uh, we want to kind of have it be like we're going to go beat beat by beat and again it's like a book club we're going to meet regularly and and talk about our progress and talk about what we think of where maybe maybe even where it's going to go where Mm -hmm. we think it might go (laughs) for those of us who haven't read it before at least um Mm -hmm. so yeah definitely if you haven't read it read first part yet go read it catch up with us by the next episode we'll be have finished part two Mm mm-hmm so yeah catch up and join in on discussion email us or tweet us your questions you can find us at at darkly lit pod Yes. 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 Darkly Lit Pod is our Twitter. 
darkly lid podcasts at gmail.com. Is that our Gmail? It's, Do we have a Gmail? I don't. We, I think <laughs> we, should, we, we did at one point. <laughs> yes, I... we no, 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 we do. We do. <laughs> Woo! Okay, okay. good. <laughs> we'll so, um, I think the one thing I want to start with is um, in the intro, we do get a description of the town of Blackbird, which Blackbird. Sorry, like <laughs> is it Blackbird or Blackberg? Um, I'm gonna call know. it Blackbird because okay. Blackbird yeah. singing in the dead of night. I mean, that's how it translates to me. <laughs> um, eventually, I, one of the things I think we will do, at least by the next episode, is. Make sure we get the pronunciation correct with some of these names. I think we got most of them correct, but um, they are Swedish names, and um, and none of us are Swedish. No, <laughs> but <laughs> we will uh, try our best with them. Yes. Mm. Uh, in this case, with Blackberg, it I mean it gets a full introduction to it. Like it, there's quite a few number of uh, paragraphs that talk about it it's as, a little like mm-hmm. like almost prologue yeah it's sort of just a look how weird and banal this place is it doesn't really have a history it's just kind of there mm-hmm. and then people come out because it's the modern thing to do and then they go there and of course because of that no one notices when some really something really dangerous moves in now mm-hmm. um in the past with uh vampire stories they tend to be more gothic settings you know castles and um uh i'm trying to go like a ancient tombs yeah they they tend crypts. to be they tend to have more of a history to them so it's interesting that i mean uh this this book uh if i recall it came out in 81 but let me confirm that really quick this book i thought came out in 2000 oh was it earlier it's set in the it's set in the it's, set, it's set in 1981 it is oh okay yeah but it, yeah it's definitely more recent uh, yeah, I was going to say, because Oscar seems like the kind of kid who in the modern day, you know, it would be listening to, I don't know. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking back to, to the emo phases of people ages ago, but he would be totally be a kid who listened to, like, My Chemical Romance. And- <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it's, a, it's 2004. You are correct. The book did come out in 2004. Yeah. So it is, uh, it does kind of twist. that much sooner. Yeah, it, it, okay. yeah, it does kind of twist the whole um, setting of... The typical vampire story in well, boring suburbia. Well, mm-hmm. yeah, it's a, it's a modern vampire story. Uh, I should point out uh, we didn't really we're not doing a bio on the author, but the author was born in Blackburg. Oh, so it is a real city. Yeah, it is a real city. Oh, okay. Um, so that that actually makes sense. I could see why the author probably wrote it there. It does feel fairly familiar. Like pl- specific places do seem very. Well, for lack of a better word, specific mm-hmm. in the book, mm-hmm. like you can tell that they know their locations, or it feels like a you know a place that's lived in. I mean, I mean, I'm trying to think. Of, I try to think about the geography of it in certain cases, but um, you know, I can only think of specific locations. You know, like the the there's the underpass, which factors big into the finale of part one. There's the or the, the overpass that you can walk under, and then there's the um, the Chinese restaurant, mm-hmm. uh, which has some B plot characters meeting in it, um, and. And then, of course, the, the, the row of a sort of, like, comp- apartment complex where Oscar and, um, uh, Oscar and crew yeah. live. <laughs> yeah. Uh, crew. I don't know why crew, you're saying yeah. crew. No, I get you. I get you. I understand what you're, what you mean, though. But it does give a very, like, I, I, I kind of get the vibe that, like, this is a place that's lived in, but also not lived in, because everything's very banal. Well, um, it also kind of explains Oscar's character, too, mm. in a weird way. Because, uh, in all honesty, Oscar's one of the most realistic 12-year-olds I've read in a mm. novel in a while. Mm-hmm. Like, this is a kid who it's like, he has trouble with his weight, he he has um, apparently problems uh, wetting himself and has to use a piss ball that he's made. The piss ball, oh my god. Yeah, mm. like he deals with bullying, um... And he's pretty severely bullied. Oh yeah, like to the point where it's pushed him to be like, I want to, you know, and you know, it's it's, re- it's it does make sense for for him as a as a twelve year old boy to be like, I want to fucking murder these these bullies. I fantasize about murdering them because they they're mm-hmm. just always hurting me, you know. But how much of it is is him wanting to get rid of his bullies, and how much of it is this this 
very disturbing fascination or like interest that he's developed. Like, is it because, well, cause like the, we, the reason there's a point where like he notices Elay and he, cause he's been playing with the knife outside. He notices Elay and for a second, he's like, I'm going to stab her. Yeah. <laughs> She's obviously not one of his bullies. No, no. but no. is that it like briefly flickers across? And it's funny because he's he. It almost seemed like before that he's like, uh, for lack of a better, I, I'm trying to think how to how to put this. He knows it's a game. He's yeah, like he's in control. Is... He's like this is a game I play. It's not like I actually want to do this, but it it's a it's a way that he kind of you know keeps himself entertained and releases some of the, the mm-hmm. tension or or at least the. Um, the pent up frustrations he has as he plays this game where he's he's a murderer and uh you know yeah it's i think it's something that's all because the way he says it like even after um pretending to stab uh a tree uh as a way of pretending of stabbing his bullies he's like it's a good game because he feels better afterwards because it feels like he it, it's a vengeance fantasy that he's sort of living out but uh, yeah it, it feels like he has control of it though um I mean, this is clearly, I don't want to say he's a troubled kid, but in a sense, like, like Sade mentioned, Oscar severely bullied, but not only that, he's also the child of divorced parents, and his mom is very overprotective of him, Mm -hmm. a little bit too much, um, in a weird way, Mm -hmm. but, um, like she's, like, she did say, you're the only one I have right now. Yeah. And there's times where he, like, leaves, and she's like, where are you going? Why don't you, we're going to watch this. Aren't you going to watch this with me? And they have, like, rituals together and such, like watching the Nutcracker together and... Mm-hmm. So... Eating those shrimp crepes. Mm-hmm. So, um... It, it's... It, Oscar's definitely a very interesting character, very realistic. I, what I really liked about this first part with him is that when we're first introduced to him, we're, we're feeling terrible for him because he's, like, bullied. He has to deal with a piss ball and, like... Oh God, you poor child! Like, yeah, yeah, you want to help him or something? Mm-hmm. But then you learn that he has this fascination with murder and dark topics, and like that was actually kind of like, I think for for most readers, that's supposed to be a little alarming. In that, like, oh, maybe you're not so innocent. I don't know. Yeah, I, I feel well, like sorry also, for you, but uh, well, he's also me, he's, all, he's also not, a, yeah, but not. I, I know it enough for you to be like maybe a little. You're still concerned, but are you also a little like, oh, you're troubled. So you're like less less quick to maybe go to his aid. <laughs> yeah. Um, Not to mention he's also like this is low key, but he he does shoplift quite often. He's a he's a little bit of a klepto, just a little. Yeah, I mean. But like at that uh, age, who didn't commit? Ha- okay, fair enough. I mean, it's not uncommon. <laughs> but here's the thing: this is also the culture of boys in general. He's also, yeah. he interacts with one of the mm-hmm. apartment kids. And oh yeah, he, the the three older like teenage oh, yeah. boys yeah. who and... who ripped off a an electronics store and got yeah. away with it, and throughout the first part are trying to sell him stolen. Um, Stolen Stolen electronics that are brand new. Like the RC car and then later the Walkman. The one thing about this town, um, and our movie, it's just the culture in general. But there is a little bit of an under, dark underbelly with Mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. I mean, mean, all these kids kind of do crime naturally. And his first thought is like, oh, I see, oh, uh, when he first meets uh, uh, Eli, uh, um, Eli? Eli. Eli, thank you. When he first meets uh, Eli, he assumes, oh, drug addict daughter or her her her, her oh they're, they're probably on drugs everybody assumes they're on drugs. drugs yeah and it's like why is this a first thought in his brain and i'm like well, I- well one of the first things we see from his perspective is a police officer demonstrating what a bag of of, of- Her- heroin it looks like yeah you know? and mm-hmm. when he's like oh, and what? everyone knows what it is but oh, no yeah. one wants to about be it. the you get the impression yeah. that they don't a lot of people in uh in uh, blackbird uh recognize that there's just this underbelly to it and they just don't like talk about it super no often. or they do and no one gives a shit it's or, just like this is what we deal with it's just ha- it's just if you them. if you talk about it it's in like hushed tones yeah mm-hmm. there there it is and for him it's like the fact that he does do these things to me feels less like ooh, what an edgy kid and more <laughs> the only the only edgy thing about I mean the only remotely quote unquote edgy thing about him is just his his scrapbook where he, he that he's into true crime and he's into grisly murders and how he wants to know everything about well to you know things that 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 sort of thing but 
think when about he, when when the, when the when the the teen, when the boy gets murdered and he just he's desperate he not desperate but he really wants to find out more of like the exact details. he wants oh. those gritty details he wants to know how the boy was killed he wants to know you know why and he's just like oh and he starts grabbing bits and putting them in his scrapbook but as we know now like especially with the popularity of true crime podcasts and uh, that's yeah that's and, not too weird Mm. I'll, I mean, maybe, I mean, yeah. Mm, I guess, wait, well, for an adult, for that an adult. makes more sense. For a child to be that fascinated that you are going out of your way to get collections of books about, you know, dark subjects, or keeping a murder scrapbook, s- stealing well, a knife so you can stab at a tree, that's when it's concerning. That well, is like... that. I mean, to me, where, to me, where I draw the line where it starts to get really kind of uh, unsettling is when he's he's got a knife that he carries around with him and he does these things and again he can justify by saying it's a game but it's that point like okay i think you're going a little far and i can definitely i definitely feel that part of it but like you know think about i mean i'm this is the question i want to pose to you we're I'll, i mean a bunch of us are interested in, in true crime and true crime podcasts now yes. but were you when you were 12 was was that something that interested you when you were twelve? Um, you can we we're all friends here. You can be honest. Yes, but I didn't make scrapbooks or I didn't make scrapbooks either. I definitely I think for me it was it wasn't really true crime and like murder that I was into. It was like horror movies and like supernatural shit, like hauntings and aliens and cryptids. Like uh, yeah, that was, well, that's me too. Honestly, I, yeah. I, mean, I Okay, so the things that I watched as a kid, and um, luckily my family watched it too, so it was easy to watch it, was there were always those true crime shows Mm -hmm. that were on, like, How to Make a Murder, or uh, Killer Kids, and stuff like that. Uh, So I grew up watching it, and it is fascinating, and of course, like you guys, like, uh, I was interested in, like, ghosts and hauntings and stuff like that, and then... But I read a lot of mystery novels, too, growing up as well. And I, um, I'm i not going to lie. My favorite ones were the ones who are like, oh, someone's been killed. How did this happen? So, uh, Murder mysteries, man. Murder mysteries are awesome. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, I had that sort of fascination. It wasn't to the extent like his was, though. I didn't, like, like I said, I didn't make scrapbooks. I wasn't like hunting down and like looking through newspapers and stuff and to see if what true crime was on right right i think the part where where it's like okay it's it's not just this fascination and it's not just fast fantasizing about you know as a stress relief killing your bullies it's not it's not just a fantasy to kind of get over that stress is when he was like okay is me taking it out on this dead tree actually causing a murder? If I really focus and learn to control this power, maybe I really can kill my bullies. Let's go out and Yeah, try. okay, fair enough. That's yeah. when you're like, mm, okay, Oscar. But I think one of the reasons why he sort of portrayed this way is because uh, of the person he's starting to develop a crush on. Mm, true, true. Because it's definitely a crush. They don't outright say it. But no, it's it, he's definitely it's it builds slowly. I kind of like the innocence of this, by the way. Yeah, there is a very there is a sweetness to how they interact. Mm-hmm. And like, um, so the way that we see the interactions between Eli and Hakan, uh, Hakan, 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 um, uh, is just by dialogue. There's no there. Those parts are just like. Uh, Hawking, Hawking, no, I'm not doing this. Don't you love me? Do you love me? That back Yeah, and yeah. You know what I like about that? It's kind of reminiscent of the fact that we never see into their apartment. And That's true. And people just hear mm-hmm. them through the walls sometimes. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I, it's like we're eavesdropping. Yes. And I like that aspect of it. I like the aspect of those scenes, those scenes they have together. But, and, and we're, we're going to get to, we'll get to Hawking eventually, but. But, like, during Hawken. those. What I'm, the point was, like, during those parts, um, you hear the Hawkins like, what's that? It's like, it's a Rubik's Cube. Where'd you get that? I borrowed it. What do you mean you borrowed it? I, I just borrowed it. What's And Eli's trying to distract from that, and it's like, this is adorable. This is this. <laughs> I know what they're discussing is awful and terrible. Yeah. But this part. Within the reality of this it, situation. It, it's kind of adorable. <laughs> like, um, that 
Eli's, you can tell there's just a slight crush between the two and how they interact and how they're like, you can borrow it. You, you can, you can have it. <laughs> I, we don't, I definitely don't, we can infer what, like how Eli feels at this point. We don't know for sure yet, but mm-hmm. we do know, we definitely get it, since we're, we're with Oscar the most. But Eli, mm-hmm. you can tell Eli's a bit nervous about admitting it to Hawken, which, right. uh, which... I don't think she's nervous, I just think she's she's tactful in that she knows it's going to upset him, and him being upset is going to make him more difficult to control. That's right, true. Right, right. And we know, like, as far as she's presented it, let's talk about Ile a little bit, what we know about her. Mm -hmm. Um, The only reason she didn't kill Oscar was there was that moment where she was like, she came close to him and she had actually cleaned herself up before that. Because one of the things, there's a lot of telltale signs about her Mm -hmm. vampire-ness. It's never outside. He only sees her at night. She's never, she never seems to get cold. She, she, She has some supernatural agility you know, jumping from a high thing and opening doors that seem heavy. And it's all very subtle. Um, the fact that she smells like, quote unquote, an infected wound, mm-hmm. probably because her hair is caked with dried blood. But one of the things she does, um, I think what in ways that shows that she has a crush is he never said that she smelled bad, but she sensed like, oh, I smell bad. And so she cleans she, herself up. Well, actually takes a shower. She, well, Oscar did ask her, is that smell coming from you? Oh, that's, oh, that's right. right. Okay. Still, that's still, like, in a, a show of, like, oh, he knows my smell. I need to smell better. Like, why would she care? There's no reason for and, but her you to, have care. to You have to wonder if she, part of the reason she did that is because she was intending to, you know, bite him and drink his blood. But um, we also, it also could, I, it, but I think it's more what you're, I think it's more implied that she's just doing it because she wants to be perceived better. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's a more... She does, yeah, but I don't think it's because she has a crush, on, a crush on Oscar. No, I don't... Well, yeah. Well, I think she takes a shower because she has a crush on him, but I... I, I she takes a shower just to seem more appealing, but not because she has a crush on Oscar. That's the way I, I'm seeing oh, it. Because I... Uh, okay. Uh, Ile, to me, is... She's a parasite. She's like a literal parasite. Oh, yeah. It, no, there's no oh, doubt yeah. about that. And... Uh, I mean, she's she's... <sighs> For lack of a better word, just as much as she's kind of being used herself, she's ultimately the one using uh, Haken uh-huh. to, mm-hmm. to do her dirty work, to, you know, to like, bring her what she needs to survive. Yeah. And there's a, there's a whole can of worms there we're going to open up pretty yeah. soon. So, mm-hmm. um, uh, but I at mean, the end of this first part, Oscar definitely goes from being curious to having a crush on Ile. Yeah. And. Ile, even if okay, so I have seen the movie. <laughs> Which it's one? It's been a long the the act the the, the one that's actually the original, finished. the two thousand and eight one that the author actually wrote the screenplay for as oh, well. Good. We are not going to acknowledge the other one. I okay, have, well, that's the only reason I ask is because I have a weird relationship and that I've never seen either movie, but I was I was waiting through. You know how at, at San Diego Comic Con, for those of you who don't know, they don't clear rooms in the big hall between panels. No. So if you get in there, you usually need to camp out there if one of the panels you want to go to is happening later, which is a policy that always bothered me. So I've had to sit through things that I didn't, ne- I wasn't necessarily excited for. Uh, through that process, I did learn. This is a slight tangent. The, uh, how much the people on Supernatural seem to love their fans. <laughs> Because oh. I've sat through like three oh, supernatural yeah. panels, despite never having seen the show, <laughs> and I love the cast because they are so cool. Oh yeah, they're, they're like so chill, and they're having a great time, and they love their fans. And so I gotta hand it to them; they, they were they're great people. I, I high fived uh, Misha Misha Collins when he came running. Oh, I'm jealous. <laughs> he, he just came jogging along the line while everybody was waiting to get in the hall H, and just high fived everybody. Oh, it yeah. was the coolest they, thing. They love their fans. The supernatural yeah. cast are awesome people. But um. But I, I sat through a panel that was for, uh, uh, is it was it just Let it's Me called, In? It's called Let Me yeah. In. Yeah. Just Let Me In. And I just remember it because, like, oh, yeah, the girl from Kick-Ass is in this. That was all I could think of at the time. Like, mm. oh, yeah, that girl. She was in Chloe Grace whatever. I know, um, I know, Moritz. I actually know what her name is. But at the time, I was like, Chloe Grace whatever. I know it's Chloe Grace Moritz. But she, she, um, she had been in Kick-Ass. And then she's like, oh, she's a vampire in this. I'm like, oh, okay. I didn't know what Let the Right One In was at the time. So that's why I, I bring it up. <laughs> a Weird long story. Weird story. Anyway, but you sorry. You were talking about the movie though. 
The actual movie. Uh, I have seen the movie. It, it's been a while since I've seen it. I don't remember when I saw it. At least three years ago is when I most recently saw it. Um, so it, so there's a little bit of spoilers in that that I've already seen the movie, and now I'm finally reading the book. So, But if I hadn't seen the movie, through part one, uh, I would be very confident in the fact that, like, Ile is a parasite. And, yes, yeah, she has Hawken now to do her bidding uh, and she's still trying to control him and, and getting him to do stuff in like saying things like, yeah, I love you mm-hmm. when it's, I don't think she means it at all. Yeah. No, um, she clearly no, absolutely doesn't. Not. Obviously not. No. And Hawkins knows that, but he's, you know, he's in there deep now yeah. <laughs> or he lays in deep on him, I should say. She's got her hooks but uh, the way I see her, viewing oscar like her interactions towards oscar is that oh here's this kid playing with a knife Mm, potential and that's why that's why she's going out there and like maybe like talking to him that's why she's cleaning up like i want this kid interested in me because i might be able to use him maybe maybe not i think the part where she almost bit him Mm -hmm. was her just <clears throat> losing losing her her senses in a bit because she was hungry. Yeah. She was trying to get Hawkins to go hunt for her, and eventually she just had to go and kill for herself. Mm. But I think in that moment, maybe a slip on her part, she cleaned up so that Oscar would find her more appealing. Oscar got too close, and she almost bit him. And Oscar touching her cheek kind of like took her by surprise enough that she like got her shit together and was like, "I gotta go." Yeah. <laughs> I gotta eat something. Yeah, yeah. Well, not, and I am, I am very curious to see where this goes in terms of like how, because yeah, she's definitely the, um, she's definitely the threat to all parties in this one. Yeah, they really play up the fact that she is a predator, a parasite, a. Um, well, I feel, she's a predator, but I think parasite the parasite is a better word for it because, um, she she I mean. She, metaphorically we definitely get that but then when she has her one big kill we've seen so far where she's she kills. strong yeah and she literally mm-hmm. latches on and doesn't let go like that's a very yeah. literal interpretation i, I think the but, difficult yeah. part too is she is a 12 year old girl and yeah. the one thing she has going for her is to appear innocent and to mm. appear uh weak right Cause, this yeah. isn't the first time we've seen child vampires in fiction, but I think yeah. this is a really mm-hmm. cool way to handle it. Mm-hmm. Um, I like the way that they keep emphasizing that she sounds, she seems or sounds older than she actually than is. Than she is, because she, no she probably isn't 12. Because even Hawken refers well, to, probably... oh, you've probably had people, other people do this for you. And she's like, yes. Yeah. So she she's definitely older than 12. Yeah, oh, no doubt. We don't was, know how old. She was turned when she was 12. Yeah. Yes. Uh, like yes. any good, like any vampire fiction, you stop aging when you become a vampire. Mm-hmm. And f- for some reason, um, and I never, uh, vampires in novels or books always say like, oh, I'm this age. And they always say it the age that they were turned mm-hmm. rather than, I mean, yeah, you're, when you're talking to a human, you're going to tell them that you're 12. But mm-hmm. why continue to act? like your well, she does they don't hear which is nice yeah there's but, there's a good reason for her to keep acting her age because that's what she's stuck as but or keep mm-hmm. acting her perceived age uh but and it even even like in the way she interacts with people she does like oscar said she doesn't sound like she's 12 she sounds so, so much older where in other novels like him <laughs> twilight uh <laughs> like why <laughs> And also, she's not going to she, uh, she's not going to school or anything, which is totally believable for a vamp like this twelve. Obviously, yeah, yeah. She See, can't go in the sun. And, okay, this yeah. is this they is, moved they moved but, to a plain town where no one asks questions either. So, mm-hmm. but it's again, it's like, and maybe this is just my complaint with Twilight. Why would you go back to high school? There's no reason as a vampire. There's to go a lot back to you could complain about Twilight. Though. I know. Let's I just, know. Let's pretend that that but doesn't I, but exist. But I know other books have done this too. It's like I'm a vampire that went back to high school. Why? There's no reason for you to go back to school. You can lie and say you're 18. You could not like th- so that this whole there's no reason for her to be in school. And I like that they show that. Yeah. Her, that she's dealing with worse shit than this yeah so far i mean say the author is handling this part really well in a way that i think is good and is is logical for what and you know never ever is it explicitly stated 
in any word. Never does the word vampire come up. No, mm-hmm. but she all. Mm-hmm. But if you, but you, but your, but the author knows the reader is genre savvy enough to know what's going on. Yeah, and I like that. Uh, also, it's not hard. <laughs> another iffy thing, and uh, yes, the novel does address this. So, as a girl, too, she does use weakness as a way to lure people, but she also has used her young sexuality. <laughs> Yeah. Which is awkward. Um, and I think this is one of the reasons why she was able to get Hawk in. Oh, yeah, for Ooh, sure. We're going to need to discuss this. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so so let's, let's tear off that band-aid. <laughs> Ow! Oh, man, there's so much hair on that band-aid. Um, Ew. So, it, it, like, early on... <laughs> it's like all the hair that's not on Hawkins' head. <laughs> Ow! <laughs> it, it is showed early on that Hawkins has a attraction to younger children mm-hmm. we get an awkward glimpse of it when he knocks out the boy he kills and just kind of lays with him and you're like is this a moment where he's taking he's trying to show his like guilt toward this unconscious child or is it something else and it's definitely uh, something else because it's like guilt yeah. tinged with you can tell he is well he does have guilt well, yes, he's definitely that? remorseful. He's gonna, he, here's what I, you know. The thing is, despite how much we were like, we are just skeeved out by by him and what he does. It does paint him as a fleshed out person. Yes, which I appreciate as someone. He feels him. guilty for what he does. He feels uncomfortable with his emotions, but he does he, it. He, he just he 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 keeps trying to find a ways to justify it and can't and just does it anyway. Yes, because he's 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 weak. Mm-hmm. With Ultimately. with killing the boy or with his fancy? no in general <sighs> in general just in general yeah. like, there's all the parts where he he's you know taking the public transit and he's talking about how like he he's a reader he wanted things to be like this he used to be a professor or he used to te- or he used to teach right yeah mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that his you know basically his old his old life either metaphorically or, or actually like burned down we still there's still a lot we don't actually know about his background mm-hmm. except mm-hmm. that he is attracted to minors. Yes. And that he has... Um, Specifically around the age of 12. Yeah, he's... He, yeah. And I don't know if he has a preference, but he definitely seems to show it in a lot. And the main reason that uh, Ile is using him is because there's even... In their conversations, he's, he keeps, you know, do you love me? I want you to love me like I love you. That kind of thing. Mm-hmm. You know, in, if I do this for you, you need to let me touch you. You know, that kind of thing. It's... It's... Ugh. Mm-hmm. Ugh. So bad, like like the moment he did that 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 things with the with the the boy that he eventually murders. I'm like like it's not much. He like he he grabs and he holds the body close and he kisses his cheek or whatever. And I'm like, mm. uh, but that was like, it's definitely uncomfortable. It's and so it, uncomfortable. it leaves you with a really gross feeling in your stomach. And then it gets worse when you find out he starts he's he has uh, paid for services. Yeah, there's well he technically. What, that's what's kind of interesting about Hawken is he's technically paid for services that he never actually received. He's gotten very close. Yeah. But it's either either his 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 guilt or as he says it's not right. It's not the way he wants it. You know what's interesting? You know what it is? He he's got this he's got this desire. He's got this mm-hmm. he's got this this perversion. Mhm. And what he wants is he wants it to be actual love. He doesn't want... Yeah, that's what I'm and that's thinking. kind of what's keeping him from finally stepping over that threshold. He wants, he wants, he wants the love. Mm-hmm. And he, does, he doesn't just want it. He wants the love to be real. He doesn't just want it to be sex or, or sexual attraction. He wants it to actually be like, like love. Like, he, like the thing he, he's talking about, like love is being completely in the service of another. another. And that's another thing where he's, he's in love with Eli. Yes. Mm-hmm. Like she's now, his beloved. And so he... that part where where Hawkins like let me touch you. I don't. I can't remember the words exactly. Uh, I actually don't even. When he said that, was that that was after? That was earlier. That was, was that earlier. It was around when he was like saying. He didn't, well, was it before or after want... Oscar touched her cheek? I know that it was after the first meeting, if I recall. I think it was before Oscar touched her cheek. Yes. I'm going to go back and take a quick look and ca- carry on the discussion, but I'm going to find it. <laughs> um, it's going to be hard to, to continue. No, it's like, I like just had it right here in my thumb. Oh man. 
Oh, by the way, did we mention that this is in um, in late October and we've only a few days have passed so far? That seems interesting. We're creeping up on Halloween. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, here it is. I found it. It's when they're talking about the, the, the Rubik's Cube. Uh, Haken, don't be like this. It'll make me happy then. What do you want me to do? Let me touch you. All right, but on one condition. No, 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 not that. You know, that kind of thing. Tomorrow, you have to. So, yeah, that's before... Yes, it That's is before that even happens. Before um, Oscar touches her cheek. Yeah. Okay. Okay, then then my argument, my... I forget what I was saying. But <laughs> oh. No, that's okay. I was like, uh, I, I kind of got what you were, I think what you were you were aiming for, and I just want to make sure I knew mm. where it was. This is after the discovery of the Rubik's Cube, but before, uh, bef- before she cleans herself up and goes to see Oscar, so... Mm-hmm. So, yeah, um, like, again, skeeved out, but much like Oscar, these are these are really well-written characters. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. The two that we zero in on. And even the side characters are not so bad. Although, did you feel like the whole thing with the Chinese restaurant was a little bit tangential? Or is it just more of a, we're going to take a moment to zoom in on the lives of this gang that meet here? I'm not going to lie. Okay, so I have read the whole book before. Mm-hmm. And, um... There's a few of these where uh, moments where the uh, tangential moments where we focus on side characters that played a somewhat of a role in the novel, but not as big as you'd hope. In, and I mean, they. I didn't mind it. I didn't. I, well, Just, I didn't mind it either. Um, it's. I. I don't mind getting snapshots of people's lives, so that way there's actually some sense of of horror when when something bad happens to them and that's and that's the idea this is this isn't the this is the first one or one of the first ones but then there's going to be more as we continue. Right. i'm not gonna lie but and it's 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 all woven together pretty well mm-hmm. like um the fact that um I, the reason why i'm a little the only reason i'm a little iffy with it was because the last book we read that did this wasn't didn't do it well are we talking about uh, the, electric the electric boner? boner? But then again, that's that no. was a self-published book that that's was true. the author freely admitted they wrote for shits and giggles. That's so. true. That's true. But in this way, yeah, it is kind of interesting to see, like, get a glimpse into their lives before, uh, into this person's life just before their, uh, the horror begins. It's, it's yeah, I, I like that those details and like how coincidental it seemed for, I forgot the guy's name who who who. Elay attacks, but it's like, oh, he got the guy, he got Hawken to drink, and you know, he by chance meets Hawken, and then later he by chance is the one that Elay takes down. Like, I don't know, I like those little, like, man, you well, like dodged that. death once, and then <laughs> I got you anyway. I, I like, I do like that too. It's actually kind of, I cool. also. That moment where he's like, hey, if you don't get through this underpass, then you're never going to make it to where you want to go. And that was, like, literally true. He didn't make <laughs> oh, it through the underpass. Goodness. Yeah. I enjoyed that. Well, it's also, like, it, I feel like that's, that's important because we, we need to see Elay commit, like, actually be a, a monster, you know? Yes. And then, but before that, we just get this snapshot of maybe life in uh, Blackaburg, you know, in this at this Chinese restaurant. You got the regulars, you've got the the like caricatured drawings of all of them, which get focused on for a bit, um, and even people who don't show up. Like there's some characters that I get mentioned that are on in caricature. Makes a cryptic remark about how one of them will will not be seen again after this night. So that's like some interesting foreshadowing. But and then before that, even we had the little the little thing with uh, with Tommy. And his mm-hmm. two friends talking about how they busted up or how they successfully robbed uh, the electronics store and then talking about the, the nature of the murder, which is like a way to have a scene that sets up some information given to you as a reader. That's what it kind of some of those scenes kind of feel like mm-hmm. that one in particular. But it had but it but it doesn't feel like it's put in there for no reason, because we also get the thing where. Tommy keeps trying to sell electron stolen electronics to uh, to Oscar. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right now, it just feels like set up for for stuff later on, and I and that does make me curious. Like, oh, how are these like separated little groups gonna come together? Yeah, that is gonna be important. Mm-hmm. Um, another another thing too um, that I do like is we begin when we begin introduce to Ely. Um, it is done in a gentle way of how we know her. Like her, her conversations with Oscar are very simple, and 
again, when we first see her, we see her as this like 12 year old girl. And Mm -hmm. it's actually kind of nice that we, when she does attack um, her first victim, that we see it from the victim's point of view. Yeah. In a weird way, then we see like, oh, we see her as kind of a monster. Mm -hmm. And that's smart. And the reason why I think it's smart is because that's how usually you interpret someone, how we would have normally interpreted a vampire who looks the way she is. Mm -hmm. If we would have done it from her point of view, we would have still like felt sorry for her but by putting it from the victim's point of view during this you're like oh oh okay maybe she isn't as like sweet and um like young and <laughs> di- as we thought she was maybe she's, she's not she's not really a vic- she's not really a victim yeah mm-hmm. like even because even when she's talking to okan she keeps saying i'm weak she, like she tries to portray herself she's like i need you i need your help mm-hmm. but yeah it is a Clearly, she's not. So. Yeah, there's a detail in there too about that death that I really like, which is explains some of the the vampire lore. Which is when Hawken goes and finds that the bodies had the head twisted around 360 degrees, and that the reason that was done is to prevent him from potentially rising as a vampire himself. Yeah, to was- shut off the body. Oh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That was really good. I really liked that. I think. Think about that. Oh yeah. my god. Yeah. So. Two things that I wanted to say. I didn't want to interrupt you guys. One with, uh, if it weren't for like, maybe even with the conversations that we kind of get to listen in um, between Hawken and Ile, up until like we finally see Ile actually kill someone, you could almost like want to like believe like, well, maybe she's not a vampire and Hawken's just a really crazy pervert who has this poor girl thinking she's something and is bringing her back blood. Like (laughs) who knows? But then we finally get to witness her as a monster. And I think because of the type of character that Ely is one being a literal monster and just, she's this character of mystery in, in our protagonist's eyes. I really hope we don't get a single chapter in her perspective because i think she needs to remain this like uh this character this thing that you cannot understand that we shouldn't be allowed to to sympathize with yeah yeah i'm with you there Uh, i i won't say anything i i (laughs) like i I do know but i won't say it i appreciate that I'm like the pro- the advantage I have over over Sade in this case is I can look and and read your face and see what kind of expressions you have and I'm, I'm oh. deliberately not looking at you only because I don't <laughs> want it to, to be spoilers. <laughs> like well, well, I don't know. Um man, I um I'm really I I really dig this uh so far. I'm really digging the book so far. It it is beautifully written. And, yeah. Um again, I think one of the as we mentioned before, these characters are very well rounded, uh-huh. and um, the way that they interact with each other feels real too. Mm-hmm. And there is this the the horror I feel um, is more in uh, I guess I want to say the unexpected, mm-hmm. like or less unexpected because we do expect her to be a vampire and all that, but just. Hmm. I guess the horror is less in, oh, she's a vampire, and more, oh, this is uncomfortable, and what she has to do to get by is... That's hor- That's like classic horror put with a very kind of modern yes. horror. It's not just, she's a monster, but more like, and look at, like, the scuzzy things that have to happen in the place around. Like, there was just mundane horror tied in around it. Yes. So, um... I think and- for me, it's more in the way people reason things Mm -hmm. like i'm doing this because of this or you know this is happening because of this like i think the way people reason life and what they do is for me that's how i how i'm taking the horror from this book (laughs) (laughs) yeah no that's fair (laughs) um yeah okay (laughs) um i do have a question for you guys sure Right right now, it's it's definitely Oscar's our protagonist, but I see Hawken as kind of a secondary protagonist. Yeah. Which one do you guys feel more pity for? Currently, I feel more pity for um, Oscar, because um, with Oscar, 
I mean, both both Oscar and um, uh, and Hawken. Hawken are mentally unstable in their own ways. Um, and I don't know. That part... But we were we were we were talking. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I, I don't know. Like I'm trying to think through it because, like, in one way, Hawken had a wonderful life, but then it has been destroyed by this perversion. And honestly, he seriously does need uh, mental help. And uh, but then. Well, I... Hmm. In a weird way, they're both kind... Like, both are haunted by... Or not haunted, that's not the right word. They're both troubled by their lifestyles. Mm -hmm. And they're just doing what they can to get by. Yeah. I I was gonna say... Um, I, I pity Oscar only because I know he doesn't know what he's getting into yet. Mm -hmm. And that's not his fault. Um, and... Haken, I definitely think has like here's the thing, he's a surprise like he is a surprisingly like interesting character to read read about and maybe and the, the the horrible part is you can actually feel a little bit of sympathy for him at times. But he's I don't pity him, I just find him pathetic. You know what I mean? Mm. Like he's already kind of he I I think he's doomed. I think he's doomed already. Mm -hmm. And he, mm -hmm. he did that to he, himself. He dug his own grave. He dug his own yeah. grave. Yeah. No, that's for me. That's why I feel more pity for Hawken because he is pathetic in that one. He knows that what he is, he knows what he is, and he knows that's wrong, and he knows the situation that he's in. But he can't bring himself to escape from it. Like he knows, he's like, oh, it would be so much. It would be, it would be a good thing if I got caught by the police right now. I almost wish our, the police were here, mm -hmm. you know. But he can't. He can't pull himself away from it. That's for me. Hawken is a very pitiful character. <laughs> he he is pitiful more so than Hawk than Oscar. And then yeah, he doesn't know what he's getting into. But he, I mean, he's got more potential in that he could get away. He could find, he could see what's happened. No, he's not. But anyway. Yeah. I, um, I, oh, it's tough. I, hmm. I, 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 the only reason why I say Oscar over Hawken is, okay, I'm going to just think in the context of part one. As of right now with part one, I feel sorry for them for different reasons. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I'm not sure if one is more than the other in terms of part one. That but as the book progresses, I'm not gonna lie. I my sympathy from what okay as when we do continue through the novel, um, my sympathy does go more towards Oscar. Mm -hmm. But um, that's all I'm gonna say. So yeah, we'll have to find out why. Yeah. next time. <laughs> next time. Next month on the thirteenth day. <laughs> um, dang, this is this is gonna be fun. Okay, so now that we've. Now that we've got, gotten through part one, um, I mean, is there anything else we want to say, or should we? Do you think we 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 close the book for now um, and start getting into the next part, and maybe put the the word out to our listeners that hey, we would love to get your feedback and would mm -hmm. absolutely dig, uh, you know, bringing you any sort of discussion questions you want to bring up. I mean, again, we're going to be on the same book for a while, so come join us, come be part of our discussion. If you're not skeeved out to the point of like absolutely no i'm not reading a book that has this kind of stuff in it then you know that's fine too Doesn't your matter. mileage your mileage totally varies with this one that, that's why we have a warning at the beginning that's why we had the warning at the beginning mm -hmm. but if you're mm -hmm. with us for this part then maybe you know come uh, see uh, post post some questions for us we we want to we want to hear what you what you think of the book and we want to know what you um what uh, questions you might have this yeah is, this definitely is, so Send us your questions if you've got your own comments that you want to, like maybe something you notice you want to point out to us. That's awesome, too. Mm -hmm. Tweet it, email it, record it and send that in, too. We'll listen to it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, yeah, I, um, I'm, I'm feeling good. I'm yeah. feeling good about mm -hmm. this one. I think one of the just – oh, go ahead. Well, I was going to ask you, Kayla, as a, as a warning to, to David and I and our listeners, does it get skeevier? Yes. <laughs> Oh, oh boy! boy. It oh does, boy! I'm not gonna lie; it does get skeevier. It does, oh boy! It does get more uncomfortable. I'm, I I kind of figured it would. And, I kind of figured it would. And I, um, I that's why for the for this episode or for a few for all of these episodes, I'll put that same warning at the beginning of every episode, just so 
viewers are aware of this that um this delves into some sensitive subjects um mm-hmm. things that can be triggering mm-hmm. um especially for those with ptsd mm-hmm. uh with with such such a uh, subject so um listener discretion is advised but and also as i mentioned before in the warning um we are a horror podcast and specifically a horror literature podcast and from what i gathered literature tends to be more um not or tends to be less afraid to go there mm-hmm. like yeah that's the thing with with what's one of the reasons why i love horror so much is because you can address darker topics more serious topics in horror than you can in like other things like mm. i was literally listening to a TED talk that addressed this point in horror like two days ago. And I can't bring up the good points that they had (laughs) because, but yeah, it's, it's, this is horror is a great place to, to address those things that we don't normally want to talk about. So. And for, for the most part, I hope viewers who listen to this understand that, especially with literature. And the reason I Mm -hmm. say literature is because, um, Movies are always held to a standard for the most part. Yeah. Like, uh, where books, you can go there. Like, you can mm-hmm. th- th- a lot of them Absolutely. do. Absolutely. I like. There's actually some books that I'm kind of afraid to read. Like, there's the one that uh, that one famous one that came out that Alone in the Dark that I've heard is like you need to mentally prepare yourself. For oh, jeez. <laughs> to balance out. Reading this, we'll read uh, Goosebumps for the next. Oh one. my goodness! Yes! <laughs> oh my gosh! Yes! You know what? Why not? Let's do it. Go into some childhood horrors. <laughs> okay, are we gonna read the first Goosebumps then? Well, welcome to Dead House. Yes. Could we could ask? We could do that, or we could ask uh, listeners for their favorite Goosebumps. Okay, book. I like this plan. So okay, okay. we're, we're, we're done. Get through- Four episodes of, of let the right one in first. <laughs> okay, after so um, after our full review of let the right one in, and luckily with let the right one in, it is a very um, long, long and very dense book. With a that's one of the great things. Each part is so meaty. So yeah. Oh, yeah. No mm-hmm. doubt. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. That I think doing a fun Goosebumps book is a great idea. So if any of you want to recommend a go- Goosebumps book uh send it our way say ooh, go for this go for that and i think um okay it's january february march april will be the last one so so in may in may will be it so around <laughs> around uh early april or late march um i'll cl- i'll see uh who has responded with what their favorite goosebumps book is and i'll put out a twitter poll I'll put awesome. it, or I'll put out a poll and see. Yeah, maybe like the four top recommended ones or the yes. ones, the four that we, we'll pick the four that we want to read the most. Exactly. Like based based off yeah. what we've seen and what sounds the most interesting. And then we'll put a Twitter poll and then see what you guys choose out of those four. And then that'll be the one to read. Luckily, with the Goosebumps books, it doesn't matter. Well, there's a couple of sequels, of course, but for the most part, <laughs> it doesn't matter which one you read. You don't have to read them. Okay, mm-hmm. apparently we, we've done the polls. We have to read Say Cheese and Die again? <laughs> <laughs> so Not the first one? I, okay. Okay, and I think also um, that'll be a fun, in May, that'll also be a fun discussion on on go- what made Goosebumps so popular and all that, yeah. not just the story itself. So. Yeah, yeah. I, I, you know what? I'm down for this. This is great. This will Thank be- you, Sade. Thank you for that suggestion. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I like this. I love this so you're, much. You're a champion. Um, so, uh, do we have any plugs? Um, uh, if you, you want to hear my voice and Kayla's voice and Alan's voice and actually everybody who's ever been on the Creative Forward Network ever has been on this show uh there's undercooked analysis uh we are carrying on uh with, with our uh into the new year or our um two time a month schedule is actually working really nicely in terms of actually getting i think stronger episodes out in terms of like what we're doing uh as of this recording there should be a couple that have released in january uh that i'm hopefully pretty happy with <laughs> one of them has already been recorded at this point in time the other well wait it comes out january 13th that's right that my brain uh so yeah we 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 hit one 
that I had a good time with. So yeah, we just recorded one. Or... We just recorded one about uh, the SCP Foundation, about uh, confinement. Um, and uh, that was fun, getting to revisit that particular universe. Uh, but yeah, you can check that out. You can always go check out back at, back episodes of Midnight Marinera, the, uh, the dormant podcast, which may soon release something. Who knows? Or not. It really just depends on when I have material I want to turn into an uh, audio drama. Um, those are my main plugs. Uh, oh, and Amusings. Yes. Animusings, which Kayla and I do on Bedview Network. Uh, yeah. If you're interested in animation and, uh, as of right now, Disney history animation, uh, go uh, listen to uh, Animusings on the Bedview Network. Uh, our next episode will be on The Lion King. So <laughs> We made it into the mid-90s. Huzzah. Woo! Um, my turn, plug something, and this may be the last time I ever plug it. No, probably not. Probably not. Um, if I end up maybe on the next UCA, I'll probably plug it. Uh, <laughs> so either shortly before or after this episode of Darkly Lit goes out, the uh, final episode of The Witching Hour should be out, unless we had a reschedule of recording again. Um, but yeah, we're just... Again. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I hope it's not too sad an episode. I hope we have a good time recording it. We've yet to record it at this moment of this recording. But uh, yeah, check out that last episode. The All of our past episodes will still be on the website. And I am going to be uploading a handful of the most recent episodes to the Creative Horror YouTube channel. All right. Um, so that's still out there if you want to check that out. That's the podcast that I did. Uh, do it did yes. okay i want to i want to say we're going to send it off uh, viking funeral style <laughs> fuck yeah we're like put in a boat burn something fire. yeah and we're, we're going to burn my computer and we're going to get drunk <laughs> and we're going to get drunk on mead and it's going to be awesome yes <laughs> sounds yep that's actually a fitting funeral for what you got <laughs> um so uh thanks again for listening i uh, uh, I guess we'll see you next time on February 13th. And um, uh, I guess we'll blow out the candles and uh, see you again for part two. Good evening, intrepid listeners. This is the Pasta Shade, the host of Midnight Marinera. And this podcast is part of creativehorror.com, a network of podcasts and creators working together to build a constructive community of horror fans. For more content like this, visit us at creativehorror.com. <laughs>